Good morning on this wonderful day. And we'll hear about some more of that a little bit later. But this is a monumental day, has been for the last uh, three days. And uh, we'll be hearing about some more of this. This is uh, such a grand and glorious day for all of us because it means so much to us. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. There's many needs among us that we need to remember. Uh, we need to remember Brother Craig Jackson's daughter. Uh, there's some up in uh, New York under Brother Hargrove that are affected with this, uh, this virus. And I think one in, that I know of in, in Houston. And so we want to pray for those individuals. She passed away this morning. Sister Fisher passed away this morning. Who Houston. did? The sister in Houston passed away this morning. Sister Fisher from Houston passed away this oh, morning. Sister Fisher from Houston passed away this morning, they said. So, so let's pray for that family. Pray for them uh, and for the church. These are things that we need to uh, take upon our heart and our mind. And let's ask God to protect and watch over all of our saints all across America and all across the world. Claire Dindecker. They asked for Request prayer for Claire Dindecker. All right. We also need to remember Claire Dindecker this morning. And, uh, of course, Brother and Sister Mitchell, they need our prayer. Brother and Sister Richter, uh, Brother Gary Wright, and the church in, there in Houston. And I'm sure there's others that we may not even know about. But the good thing about that is that God knows and so when we ask him to watch over all the saints uh, he's able to know each and every one of us that's why it says about uh, having even the hairs of our head he, uh, he knows he knows the number and so uh, let's go to the lord in prayer heavenly father lord we come before you thanking you for your mercy lord and thanking you for your love and asking that you look down, Lord, and to help us, Lord Jesus. Help our saints, Lord, the ones that are, are sick, the ones that need help, Lord. Would you extend your hand of mercy, Lord, and compassion to them, Lord. Touch them, Jesus, Lord, for they need you, Lord. And these that are suffering under this virus condition, Lord, God, would you touch them. Sister Fisher, Lord, her family, watch over them, help them, Lord, comfort them. Comfort that church, Lord. Comfort all these, Lord. And put that hedge of protection uh, about us, Lord. We ask these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> do want to say here today, I mentioned that this is a glorious and a wonderful day for us. Uh, and as we go through this, uh, I'm hoping I can get all this in. It's a tremendous amount of information to try to give you in such a short period of time. But uh, when you realize the significance of it, you'll realize how blessed we are that Jesus didn't just die on the cross and that was the end of it but that He rose again on this third day. And so we, we want to be appreciative of that. And as we go through this, uh, I hope it gives us a better understanding of it. Uh, I'd like to start here uh, in Job, the 14th chapter. And uh, 14th chapter and the 14th verse. And, 
And a lot of this, what Job uh, is saying here, uh, we use a lot of times in funerals. Uh, but there's, it's not a, what he's saying is not necessarily sad. The first part of this chapter may be, but what he has to say starting here in the 14th verse is wonderful. It's marvelous. It's uh, something that we can hold on to and Job himself hung on to. But he asks the question in, in the 14th uh, verse, if a man die, shall he live again? All the... All of the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Job knew there was a change that was laid out before him. And he goes on in the 15th verse and says, Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou will have a desire uh, to, to the work of thy hands. For that... For now thou numberest my steps, thou uh, doest thou not watch over my sin, and my transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up my iniquity. Now, Job is referring here to uh, that there's going to be a time that his his sins are going to be sold up like in a bag, and his iniquity is not going to be remembered. And uh, these things uh, he's referring to, of course, is his forgiveness and through sacrifices that he made, but it stretches out further than that because it reaches all the way down to Jesus' death. And he's that final sacrifice. Uh, that all these others had been pointing to. All those sacrifices made in the Old Covenant, they're pictures of, of Jesus and the things that He goes through. And, and not only that, but Brother James Alvarez used to say, uh, every part of that, that tabernacle in the wilderness, you can find Jesus there. And I've often made the statement that the Old Testament is like a neon sign that's pointing to Jesus and pointing to the plan of salvation. And so we can take hope in that. But here, uh, Job, uh, he has more to say on this uh, a couple of chapters over. And uh, I'd like to... I'll start here. I'm going to try to get through this as quick as I can. So if you don't get it the first time, just watch it again. In the 11th verse of uh, chapter 19, it says, He has kindled His wrath against me and He has counted me as one of His enemies. His truths uh, come together and raise up their way against me and encamp about my tabernacle. He has put my brethren far from me, and my acquaintances are very estranged from me. My kinfolks have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They dwell in my house, and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreat it for the children's sake of my own body. And uh, so he's relaying a condition uh, that he himself was in and how he was forsaken, how he was uh, despised. And we know the story of how even his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? But if you read those first few verses, you'll see that these some of these same things happen to our Lord Jesus. Some of these same uh, verses can apply to Him. Just like it said, His troops come against me and raise up their way against me and encamp round about my tabernacle. Didn't, they, didn't the soldiers uh, encamp about Him even when He was uh, dead, they were fearful uh, that something may happen and all of a sudden he come alive. Well, sure enough, uh, 
So some of these verses can uh, point right to Him because we know He was forsaken. His disciples, His close ones forsook Him. Uh, and a lot of His family uh, did not believe in Him, did not trust Him. Uh, it looks like Mary was the only one for, for much of the time uh, after his father had passed, after Joseph had passed away. But anyway, here in the 20th or 19th chapter, he, he relays a uh, uh, 19th verse, All my inward friends abhorred me, and, when I, and they whom I loved turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh. I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. And so, yes, Jesus suffered much like a, a Job. And He went through so much there in that, uh, the last few days of His life. But watch what, what uh, Job says because there's something more uh, that He realized and that He knew. And I thought it was uh, comical here in the 23rd verse. He said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they may be printed in a book. I guess old Brother Job never realized that the words he was speaking was going to be printed in a book and last all these years and come down to us. And so uh, that did happen. And we're reading them here today. And he goes on to say, And that they were graven with an iron pen and and led in the rock forever. And watch what he says here in the 25th verse, because this was his hope. For I know this wasn't something that he uh, had any doubts about. Job knew. You know, we can know. Uh, Jesus said, Blessed is he that has not seen me and yet believeth. And uh, for he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job knew his Redeemer. Or he was going to have a Redeemer. And he says, uh, and though my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. What a thought that he would see one day with his own. And he says, uh, 27th verse, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. <clears throat> Though my reins be consumed within me. And so, this was a promise Job was holding on to that he was going to get to see the Lord Jesus uh, and that he was going to see his Redeemer. And uh, just as Job said he knew, I think I know too that Job was one of those that came forth in Matthew 27, 52. And uh, I know I'm trying to move fairly fast, but let's go to Hosea. And let's see, the 13th chapter. And he's talking to Israel here. And I want you to understand that this goes a little bit deeper than what we can, uh, what we can think of or what will be easily to be missed if we don't pay attention to what we're reading. Here in the... 13th chapter and the ninth verse. It says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. We know Israel brought calamity upon themselves, but there was hope for some of them that would uh, recognize Jesus, that would accept Him. And let's read on. Uh, in the 10th verse, I will be thy king 
where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou sayest, Give me a king and princes? I gave thee a king in my, my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hid. And Ephraim is a, a, a word, it's one of the major tribes of Israel. We know that Judah and Israel split. And uh, Ephraim was, after that point, was many times uh, recognized as Israel. And the 13th verse, the sorrows of a prevailing woman shall come upon him. Uh, he is unwise son, talking about Ephraim or Israel, or that he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. Now here is a hope that, that Hosea records here in the 14th verse. I will ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. And so we can see that, that he goes on to talk about some of the destruction that's going to come upon Israel. And I feel like the 15th and 16th verses are referring to AD 70. Uh, but my point is here that he's going to ransom those that believe uh, in him uh, from the grave. And that's where our hope is. Uh, one other scripture here in the Old Testament I want to refer to is in Isaiah. 26 chapter. Twenty six, and uh, let me see. Well, we just pick it up with the nineteenth for well, thirteenth verse. We'll start there. O Lord, our God, other lords besides Thee have had dominion over us. But by Thee only will we make mention of Thy name. We know that there was other kings, other rulers, other nations that ruled over Israel. And this is what Isaiah is saying, that they had dominion over them. But in the 14th verse, watch what he says. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Their memory, as far as God is concerned, has perished. Or in other words, they will not be remembered. And then let's look down here to the 19th verse. This is what he's referring to the saints of Israel uh, and uh, the prophets uh, that were went before. It, this is what he's referring to all the way back to Matthew 27, 52. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So what's this all about? It's about a resurrection. Uh, when Job said, uh, uh, if a man dies, shall he live again? And these verses we, we read, they're referring to, uh, to all these instances that God uh, has a resurrection plan and not just a resurrection but several resurrections that God has planned there in uh, in the, let's see uh, when David uh, put away Absalom uh, there was a wise woman that came to him and these are the words that she said we are as 
talking about people, we as are whipped as water is poured out upon the ground. We cannot be gathered up again. And uh, just, lo just like when a person dies, mankind cannot do anything really much to, to uh, revive them. Uh, we know cases where, you know, they give uh, uh, CPR and they shock their heart and these people uh, come back to life for a little bit, but they're going to face another death. They're going to go through another one. But here he's talking about there's going to be some that face an eternal death, but yet we, if we serve God, if we believe in God, we have a resurrection plan. And this is not like any other resurrection. Uh, because, and I'm going to go into that a little bit deeper. Uh, because this resurrection that he's talking about was uh, Matthew 27, 52. And that's where we get into uh, what I'd like to go into here today. I'm going to... I want to apologize for my artist work. I've done this real quick this morning, but I will have uh, some others that uh, will do this upright. But this is just for, for today. I got inspired with it this morning and want to refer to it. I hope you can see this fairly well. But this is a this is talking about a type and an anti-type. And you can see I got a cross right here in the center. Because there was a time. There was something that pointed to this cross. There was something that pointed to Jesus' death. Not only to his death but to His resurrection. And everything that happened in these three days here in the Old Covenant, we can read of it in the Old Testament uh, and Leviticus 23, uh, 9 through 14 describes all this. But the 14th day was the Passover. And as you notice, I've got it each day split. And you notice I got darkness over here on the left side because the Jews, uh, the Jewish nation, this is the way God planned it. Their day started in the evening, not in the day. And so, here was Passover on the 14th day. 14th day, that's when that transpired. And the scripture says, the lamb shall be slain between the evenings. Between the evenings means uh, is to be slain about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Because they were to eat of it later about six o'clock and so here we have jesus or uh, we have the lamb that was offered that was slain and then they put they put it on the doorpost and we know how they were to stay in their houses and be covered by the blood well the next morning they came out but and they left egypt but talking about this picture here, the Passover, then the next day was a Sabbath. And I'm trying not to get too detailed here, uh, but it was a high Sabbath, they call it. A high Sabbath means that it was the start of the uh, Feast of, of Unleavened Bread but it was also a Sabbath day. And that happened also when 
uh, Jesus uh, when he was crucified. And so we have that. Then on the 16th day was the, uh, the first fruits were offered up. Now isn't it wonderful that we look out today and we see trees blooming and flowers blooming. It's a sign of life. Well, I don't think that's any accident. I think that's the way God had it planned that uh, we would even see in nature that God brought forth life. Now, uh, so we see this Passover and then the day of first fruits. This was their time of their early harvest. Their harvest uh, was of barley and, and of wheat. Uh, but before they could even eat of it, they were not to eat of any of the, this harvest till they provided a wave offering on the day of first fruits. And that is on the 16th day of Nisan. The, uh, the 14th day was the day that it was to be slain. And 16th day, they waved a sheave of first fruits before the Lord. They had to take it before the priest, and that's what he was doing. Now, why are you telling us all of this, Brother Jesse? Well, because of what it means to us. Here Jesus was our Passover lamb. We haven't been being slain here on the 14th day. Laying in the grave on the 15th day. And on the 16th day, what happened? Praise God, He raised from the dead. That's when the angels came and rolled back the stone. You know they didn't really have to roll back the stone because Death was not going to contain Jesus. That tomb was not going to contain Him because He was coming forth with a new body. He was coming forth with a body that was no longer bound by physical uh, uh, physical attributes like we are and like He was before the resurrection because after His resurrection, He could appear and disappear. He could walk through a wall. These are all things that happened to him. But praise God, he came forth. And that stone was rolled away so others could recognize that he was no longer dead. His words had come true. He said, on the third day I will rise again. Praise God, he did rise again. I am so thankful of that. But... That's not the only thing I want to make mention because in Matthew 27, 52, it says that the graves of the saints were opened up and after His resurrection. And many people place this resurrection at His crucifixion. But if you will read closely, you'll see that it says after His resurrection. Well, what's so important about that? Let's go back to these feasts. Sixteenth day was what? The beginning of the first fruits. The feast of first fruits. That's when that sheave was waved uh, before the Lord, thanking Him for the harvest. Well, what harvest was this... Uh, with Jesus. This harvest was those in Matthew 27, 52. This was Job. This was the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, and we can see many of them recorded in, uh, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Because at, toward the end of that chapter, if you'll look and see, it says, these without us could not be made perfect. Now, Jesus was the first fruits of them that were resurrected. Well, wasn't other people resurrected? Even under the old covenant, wasn't there some people that were resurrected? There was even a man that was thrown into 
into a cave because they were fearful of some uh, some enemies coming and he landed on some bones of a prophet and he resurrected well then how could Jesus be the first fruits if other people were resurrected I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about that how can that happen how can, that, how can he be the example well I'm going to tell you how because Jesus was the first fruits of someone that was dead that would not have to die again. Jesus was resurrected from the dead and He would never, ever face death again. Well, what happened at 2752? Matthew 2752. These saints of the Old Testament. They lived such an exemplary life uh, that they were promised a better resurrection. And they came forth at Matthew 27, 52. And Jesus Himself instructed them. Uh, we can see that recorded in, in the book of Corinthians when He said He was seen above of 500 men. Above 500 men. Well, who were these 500? He only had 120 uh, in the upper room. Well, these 500 were those that were resurrected at Matthew 27, 52. And because they were resurrected there, they became a first fruit like Jesus. In other words, their soul, not, I'm not talking about their body, because their soul was going to move out alive. Brother William Souders used to call it highballing the graveyard. And so if you can live the life Jesus did, you can come forth, or not come forth, you can die a death of this physical body, but your soul does not have to lay there asleep, waiting, uh, for what God has planned. Because I believe that those saints uh, that have gone on, their, their bodies gone, but their souls are resting underneath uh, a spiritual picture of the, the golden altar. And they're there. And I think this is part of the people that God, that Paul was talking about uh, and the place that Paul was talking about. He said, I... I knew a man in Christ, uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I could not tell. But such a one was called up, not into third heaven, but up to third heaven, and heard things that was unlawful for him to, hit, to uh, uh, reply to, or to say, or to talk about. And uh, then you have it recorded over in the Revelations about those souls crying out, Oh Lord, holy and true, uh, when are you going to avenge our blood? And so I think these people are, are alive. They're, they're souls alive. They, they recognize they're not just sleeping, but they can hear uh, things of heaven going on. God can talk to them. Jesus can talk to them. And in cases like, like where Paul uh, was called up. I think he was listening to Jesus, but you know, I think uh, they can rehearse among themselves, and that's why they cried out to the Lord, O oh, holy and true, how long will thou not avenge our blood upon the people? So on the 16th day, that was a day of first fruits, and not only did Jesus come forth not to die again, but there was saints of the Most High God that deserve a better resurrection that came forth here in, uh, on the 16th day. And uh, they went into the city and they, re they were part of that 3,000 that was uh, there uh, around the temple compound when Peter stood up 
and began to tell them about this wonderful baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's why one of the this is why one of the, this is so wonderful because type met anti-type. All the lambs that were slain in the old covenant. And unfortunately, there were some lambs slain after Jesus' death and after His resurrection. But you know, they had no efficacy because Jesus had become the Lamb of God that was slain. And He was without spot or blemish, just like the, the uh, Passover lamb that we talked about last week. And so, this is where everything came into being. And because of this, because of this, our calendar was changed. Jesus changed our calendar. That's why we had uh, B.C. and A.D. And, and let me say, uh, because I've run into this before, and I want you to understand, B.C. means before Christ. A.D. does not mean after death. Because some people have the, the feeling that uh, A.D. means after death. No, it means Anto Domingo, and that means the day of our Lord. And so, when Jesus was born, it changed time. It changed the calendar. We still recognize that today. And even people uh, that may not believe in Christ, uh, may not believe that He was uh, the Messiah, may not believe all these things, when they, they sign a document today, when they sign it, it has A.D., the year of our Lord. And so, uh, this is what's so wonderful about this. And I wish I could compact this all down into one little session. Uh, but I, I do want to cover just a few more things here. Uh, let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This is a wonderful chapter uh, for you to study and go over uh, because uh, it lays out a lot of these things that are so important to us. And I'm going to uh, start it. Let's see. I'm going to start it at the 12th verse of the 1 Corinthians 15. And it says, uh, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? What Paul was, he was speaking directly to the Sadducees. Uh, some of them did not believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in any resurrection. And this is what Paul was dealing with. This, this is part of what he f had to fight in his, uh, in his putting forth of the Gospel. And the 13th verse, because uh, it looks like appearing from this, here he's writing to the Corinthians that even some of the Sadducees uh, believed in Christ and, and came, but yet they did not believe in the resurrection. And so this is what he was dealing with. And he says, 13th verse, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. So he was letting those Sadducees know Hey, you can't just believe in Jesus' resurrection. There is another resurrection uh, that, that we can take part of. And he was letting them know that there will be other resurrections. <clears throat> 15th verse. And yea, we are found false witnesses of God, 
because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom if He did not raise Him up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, again, He says, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And watch what he says here in the 19th verse. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have of all men most miserable. He was letting those Sadducees know that if you just believe in Christ just for this life, then you're of all men most miserable. He was trying to point to them that there is something more, there's something better, uh, even than than having Him just in this life. And in the 20th verse, He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and He's become the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits of those that slept that would resurrect to not die again. That's what that first fruits is. It's not just talking about some being raised and then happen to die. But they could go on to perfection and move out a live soul. And uh, let's read on. Uh, 21st verse. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of, of the dead. Death came by Adam and the resurrection by Jesus Christ. For in Adam all die. Even so, Christ shall be made, all in Christ shall be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, there's that word again, first fruits. Afterwards, they that are at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. And when He should have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He's talking about His millennial reign there. When that thousand years is finished, uh, there's going to be Gog and Magog and and finally, God's going to wipe out all the ungodly that's living on the earth. And there will not be any person alive that has sin in their life. And the wages of sin is what? Death. death. So therefore, there will be no more death at that point. Death has been eradicated through what Jesus did. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. And because He did, we have a hope of overcoming death also. And uh, let's continue the 27th verse. For He has put all things under His feet, but when He saith all things are put under Him, it is manifested that He is accepted which did put all things under Him. Paul's not just double speaking here. He's talking about God allowed Jesus to put everything under His feet, but God Himself is exempted from that. God is not subject to Jesus. Jesus is subject to God. And the 28th verse, And when all things shall be subdued unto Him, then shall the Son also be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all and in all. And so, uh, this 15th chapter goes on into uh, Paul talking about celestial and terrestrial bodies. He's talking about uh, when you sow this body, that's not what's quickened. Uh, God gives it another body. And uh, I'm trying to... Well, let me just read a little bit more of this. Um, 
34th verse, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. You know, uh, Paul was telling them he speaks this to their shame. Well, to some of us, that Paul could say the same thing about uh, that we haven't studied this, we haven't looked at, into the Word of God, and we should know some of these things. And so this is what uh, can apply to us. In the 35th verse, he says, but some men will say, well, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Because this is part of what the Sadducees were trying to use man's logic to figure out these things. Well, Paul was telling them, uh, you're looking at it uh, with man's sight, not God's sight. Uh, in the 36th verse, he says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bear grain. It may of chance be of wheat or some other grain. And he's using natural agriculture to try to get his point across. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased Him, and to every seed His own body. He goes on to say, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of birds, another of fishes, and another... Uh, Oh, it says another flesh of beasts and another of fishes and another of birds. 40th verse. Watch this. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And uh, there is... Uh, one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differeth from another in glory so also is the resurrection of the dead what's he talking about he's making comparison between uh, celestial and terrestrial bodies Jesus came forth with a celestial body he came forth with an angelic body. I said that stone did not have to be rolled away for Jesus. It was rolled away for uh, man's uh, thoughts and man's ability to understand that he, that he rose from there. Because if that stone had stayed over, then people would say who appeared to them was not really Jesus. It was somebody that looked like Jesus. But God performed a miracle when He rolled back that stone for our understanding that the Lord Jesus resurrected from the dead and God had given Him a celestial body, one that could appear and disappear, but yet be flesh and blood. Uh, that's why He told Thomas, here, here, stick your finger into my, into my, uh, my hands. Stick it, your hand into my, my uh, uh, side because... He said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones like this. Well, that was a celestial body that God had given him. That body that was sown in, the, uh, in that tomb, when it came forth, it wasn't exactly like the body that he had before because it was bound by physical limitations. But he says there is terrestrial bodies. There are bodies that are different from celestial bodies. The terrestrial body cannot go through a wall, cannot disappear, cannot appear somewhere else. It is confined to physical limitations. And uh, <clears throat> so Paul goes on to say, let me pick it up at the 42nd verse again. I'm trying to rush through this just as quick as I can. So so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so, <clears throat> so he's talking and he's using even Christ as a picture of that. How he was sown a natural body, but he came forth as a spiritual body or a celestial body. And I'm going to try to wrap this up real quick. Uh, let's go on to uh, the, let's see, 50th verse. No, 49th verse. No. <laughs> let's go to the 47th verse. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from, Adam, from heaven. Adam was of the first man of the earth, earthly. The second man was Jesus, the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such, such are they also which are earthly. And as to the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doeth incorruption inherit, neither doeth corruption inherit incorruption. Now what Paul is saying, uh, he's making a reference here. Uh, that even those that uh, it says the meek shall inherit the earth and those that receive a terrestrial body it's going to be changed too because it's not going to have corruption no longer in that body that body will live forever and in, in that just in that instance it is a like the celestial body that it will not uh, inherit corruption. So both of them live forever. 51st verse. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about both celestial and terrestrial bodies. All of them will be changed. And in a moment, and in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? Now, I'd like to stop there just a moment. O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? These that came forth as first fruits. That can be spoken of them because death did not claim them forever. Death could not hold them forever. Death was not able to keep them uh, from coming forth. So that they lost that sting, uh, the sting, and the, and the grave lost its victory. And he goes on to say, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. <clears throat> but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so Paul's letting them know that uh, the resurrection that God has planned. There's a resur first resurrection, which we call 
uh, the bride members, they, they move out a live soul and they receive a celestial body. And then there's those that have a terrestrial body. And Paul talks about those that are alive and remain. And I want to cover that uh, just for a little bit because there's going to be some that's alive here on the earth when Jesus comes to catch away the bride. And you can go into uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, and I believe it's 17, and it, it tells you about that resurrection. And uh, it says, those uh, that are slain in Christ will He bring with Him. Those, and, and that's, that doesn't mean asleep like this. That just means they're resting because they have not had a work to do until Jesus picks them up. And when He picks them up, uh, they shall arise first or they shall be called up to Jesus first. And then He comes on down to the earth and those that are alive and remain, they shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. You know, if some of us are left here when Jesus still comes and we have overcome this old carnal nature and that we have lived for, uh, for Christ, and when that happens, when Jesus splits that sky to come and catch away His bride, our body shall be changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. And we will receive a celestial body that's not bound by physical limitations. Just like when Jesus rose up to heaven uh, to go back to be with His heavenly Father and they stood gazing, looking, they said the same Jesus shall return in like manner. Well, praise God if there's some of us that are still alive and remain when He comes. Then guess what? If we're living for Him, if we've overcome this old man, then, then physical limitation is going to lose its ability on us because we shall be changed in the moment and a twinkling of an eye and we will start rising up in the air to meet Jesus in the air. And there He will take us to be with His heavenly Father to present them as a bride. So this is what this hope of the resurrection is about. And it's not just for the bride. That's the greatest uh, uh, mark that we can meet. That's, that's the greatest reward we can have. But, you know, being a uh, part of the meat and being having a terrestrial body, that's going to be wonderful too. And let me close with this one, this other scripture that Paul uses. He says, I has not seen, neither has, uh, I has not seen, help me a little bit. <laughs> Uh, eyes not seen, neither has it even entered into the mind of man what we're thinking. The things that God has prepared for them that love Him. What is so marvelous, we can't even imagine. We can't even uh, comprehend it in this old mortal body. But it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be glorious. And thank God that on uh, what we call Easter morning, uh, maybe we all change that to resurrection morning for Jesus. When we, when we have that, that brought hope to all mankind that those that would follow Him could have that very same hope of living forever for having eternal life. Praise God when you think of uh, this season, I hope you it gives you a greater hope because God has wonderful things prepared for us. Uh, oh, I didn't read these. <laughs> uh, these were the prayer requests. Also, Bella v uh, Vili. Uh, she has her strongest day of chemo coming. Let's remember them. 
the health care workers and uh, the home folks, please uh, <coughs> stick around for important announcements. <laughs> okay.
you can post your prayer requests here. Um, we can, there's one on here, you can look and just take a look and see how it works. Um, everybody that gets on this website will be able to see them, so keep that in mind. If, you, if it's something that you don't want people to be able to find, keep that in mind because this is a public site. Um, but this is a good opportunity for us to be able to share it with each other while we're apart and still keep up. Um, we have also, we added the link to add your phone number to the calling tree. So if you're not getting calls right now from the calling tree, we don't have your current number. So make sure that if we have your current phone number or whatever number you would like to be contacted by, that's done here. I also want to note in the future we may have some things that are password protected. We'll discuss it and see what needs to be protected. If you come across something like that and you can't get in, let us know. We'll get you in. It shouldn't be a problem, but if you have problems, just let somebody know. Um, Bible school registration. As you all know, this usually starts around this time of year. We put out the forms in the foyer, but since we can't meet, we're going to put a registration online. It's not up yet, but it should be up in the next few days. Go ahead and register your kids through that form. And besides that, I think that's all. If you have any questions about this site, let me know. Okay, um, one more thing. <laughs> we also have a place for offering. Um, on the home page. It's on the home page on the bottom. I can't find the notes. <laughs> but if you are this the home page, the, the first landing page, you scroll all the way to the bottom, there'll be something that says give, a little button that says give. It'll redirect you. You can use your credit or your debit card, either one. It is safe. It's not taking money out from the church, it's just going in. So if you need to give offering that way, that is available. And we will be updating this as regularly as we can. Um, keep checking back, especially in the media section. We'll be adding more songs, more services, all that. And so that's all.